Am I hearable? Yes. Let's get going. It's uh, time for poetry, folks. Welcome to the ZSR Library Lecture Series. Uh, I'm Craig Fansler, and it's a pleasure to welcome you today. Uh, I want to introduce our two uh, writers and speakers, and then I'll let them take it away. Um, Amy Catanzano is an assistant professor of English and the poet in residence at Wake Forest, teaching poetry workshops in the English department's creative writing minor. She also serves as the director of the minor and co-director of the Dylan Johnston Writers Reading Series, which brings contemporary poets and fiction writers to campus each year. Prior to joining the faculty at Wake Forest a year ago, Amy taught in Naropa University's Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poets. Just let that settle for a second. Um, which was co-founded by Allen Ginsberg and Ann Waldman in 1974 in Boulder, Colorado. Amy has an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop at the University of Iowa. Amy Catanzano's most recent book is Starlight and Two Million, a neo-scientific novella, published earlier this year by no Noemi Press, independent publisher of poetry, fiction, and cross-genre writing based in New Mexico. Joanna Ruoco is assistant professor in creative writing and has published several books of fiction, both novels and story collections. Her book, Another Governess, The Least Blacksmith, a Diptych, won the Fiction Collective II Catherine Doctorow Innovative Fiction Prize, judged by Ben Marcus. Her latest book, Dan, is coming out from Dorothy, a publishing project this October. She publishes romance novels pseudonymously. Did I say that right? Pseudonymously. As Alexandra Shabazz and Tony Jones. So I can call you Tony if I want. Her stories have appeared in numerous journals, including Noon, Conjunctions, and A Black Warrior Review. She's also been included in several anthologies, including Pushcart Prize 28 and The Force of What's Possible, Writers on Accessibility in the Avant-Garde. With Ben Kahn, she edits and hand makes Birkensnake, an annual fiction journal. She holds an MFA in Literary Arts from Brown University and a PhD in Fiction from the University of Denver. So, take it away, poets. Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting us and for making um, these beautiful broadsides, which I don't know if you're going to announce, but um, there are letterpress broadsides of um, a bit of my fiction and some of Amy's poetry that Craig made on the letterpress here, and they're absolutely beautiful, and they're up for grabs. Perhaps even in triplicate, because there, there are many of them. Um, <laughs> but thanks to everyone um, for coming. I'm going to read from, um, from Dan, my new book, but um, I was going to start by, by reading something uh, very short that I just wrote because I like to take uh, opportunities of the reading forum to expose myself by reading something extremely raw and un untested. And um, my, my publisher, um, Danielle Dutton from Dorothy, said um, she needed me to write um, a quick piece for her for a magazine and it had to be under 400 words and it had to be about an uncle <laughs> so I thought okay um, and I wrote this the face of things I had three uncles the one I loved most was mind controlled by a fungus it was the kind of fungus you get if you clean your ear with a very old vegetable the uncle I loved most used to work in the produce aisle at a grocery store. The produce aisle was like an old folks home for vegetables, and that's where my uncle got the fungus. He snorted a pharmaceutical powder and washed his head with a special shampoo, but the fungus kept growing until it poked through the top of his skull. If you didn't know better, you would have thought it was a case of spinal ejection. That so much the fungus looked like a spine. As soon as the fungus pokes out through the skull, it starts receiving signals from funguses on other planets. My uncle was extremely tall, so the signals were especially strong. He made himself stilts so he was even taller, and I made stilts too, so we could walk around together and talk about the galaxy. 
technically my uncle was dead and it was the fungus I was talking to with my dead uncle transmitting what the fungus was saying and acting as a translation device. I knew this, but I still thought of the fungus as my uncle. It's hard to love things that don't have faces, and my uncle was the face of the fungus. I loved him a lot. One day, my other two uncles cornered me as I was stilt walking an observatory hill. They doused me with gasoline and tried to light me on fire, but I ran fast on my stilts and their lighters kept going out as they ran after. Later, they said they were trying to save the human race. This is terrible, but years after the uncle I loved most disappeared, I found my other two uncles dead in the cab of their work truck. I saw the silhouettes and thought at first they had been mind controlled by a fungus. They had long things poking out of the tops of their skulls, but with them, it wasn't a fungus. It was a case of spinal ejection, plain and simple. Well, now for something completely different, sort of. And this, um, I'm going to read uh, from page 103, right? Because why not start in the midst of things? Um, in, so I guess some things that you, you need to know, though you might not need to know anything. Um, Dan takes place in the small American town of Dan, and it follows a main character named Melba Zuzzo through, um, through one day in which she has a sort of crisis of being. And, and many strange things are happening um, around her. Um, a popular young mother has, has died um, of helium poisoning, filling campaign balloons. And, um, and there's some confusion with Melba about, about her identity. She was mistaken for this popular young mother at one point. And she, um, she negotiates with um, authority figures. Um, many of them are men. And, and the, the book um, sort of proceeds linear, linearly, but um, it's, it has... Um, kind of a recursive quality. There are many flashbacks. And so I'm going to read um, a scene that begins when Melba has blacked out at her job um, where she works in a bakery. And she's woken up on a man's couch, um, Don Pond. He's the first customer of the day. And she's on his couch. But um, <clears throat> the, the, the scene immediately goes into Melba re recalling a conversation she had with her mother, Gigi Zuzzo. And, um, and then that occasions further reflection. So it, it, I'm just going to read that conversation, but it's going to involve <clears throat> um, some, some dips into the past. So Melba's just woken up. So this was what it was like to be unemployed, thought Melba navigating a man's couch, poaching in the thick, unclean daylight as the man bustles about hosting. Of course, Melba knew there were different forms of unemployment. Some people opted for chemical comas. Others ate pears in the face of the wind that blew strongly on the top of the mountain. Others shopped, relying on the television and telephone to identify goods and place orders, or visiting the outlet stores on White Street where damaged or slightly soiled blouses and slacks appeared in bins at unpredictable intervals. Melba Zuzo did not shop very often, never having had the time, but some girls shopped a great deal. Melba had been warned by her mother that she did not shop enough, and that by not shopping enough, she was jeopardizing her chances for long-term happiness. The conversation had shocked her, but whether it was because of what her mother had said or because she had not expected to speak to her mother at all on that occasion, she could not be sure. She had picked up the telephone to place a call to her landlord, Mark Rand. Mark Rand, she had said. Speaking, replied Gigi Zuzzo. Melba had paused, perplexed. She felt the impulse to pull the telephone receiver from her head and examine it, but she did not give in to this impulse, which she knew to be a stupid one. Instead, she looked around the vestibule where her coats hung on pegs and the telephone sat in the center of a tiny telephone table. Do you want to know what he's saying? asked Gigi Zuzzo. Melba heard muffled laughter. Yes, said Melba. Melba, barked Gigi Zuzzo. Did you really mean to call a man a landlord at his private residence so as to demand a report on what he is at that moment saying in private conversation with a female visitor? No, said Melba. That is good, said Gigi Zuzzo. It would reflect badly on me. It would embarrass me in front of a landlord. And Mark Rand and I have just gotten past all of that, our differences in status. There's a fume, said Melba Zuzzo, in the house. 
I should hope it's in the house if you're calling Mark Rand, said Gigi Zuzzo. A landlord has a great deal of responsibility, it's true, but he can't be expected to go about looking into every stray fume that attracts a tenant's notice. Have you heard of the atmosphere? Yes, said Melba. But, well, that's the source of fumes, Melba. Now, do you think it's Mark Rand's job to upkeep the atmosphere? No, said Melba. I, whose job is it, asked Gigi Zuzzo. Astronauts, guessed Melba. <laughs> she heard a faint pop. Did you hear that, asked Gigi Zuzzo. I snapped my fingers. Yes, Melba, astronauts. The division of labor gives us landlords and astronauts, thank goodness, or men like Mark Rand would never rest. He's overworked as it is. You don't understand what it's like. Mark Rand does rest, make no mistake, but rarely. He has a bed for nodding off now and then, but it's impossible for him to spend an entire night in his bed. For one thing, many people use it, and not all of them use it at the same time. You sign up for particular time slots and pay accordingly. Mark Rand is a landlord in the first instance, so even if he is so tired he's swaying on his feet, he would never do anything irregular. He would never evict the people in his bed without the proper notice, and by the time he gave the people proper notice they'd be out of the bed anyway and new people in their stead. Now why would you bother Mark Rand when for practical and ethical purposes an astronaut is the appropriate choice? Melba considered. Like most people in the course of her life she had come into contact with an astronaut but only briefly in a controlled setting and she had no idea where he might be now. Of all people astronauts can be in the most places anywhere on earth but also anywhere not on earth and so it is especially difficult to guess their location. Melba tried to summon a picture of the astronaut as she had seen him in the auditorium and later the cafeteria of Dan Elementary. It was so long ago had he worn a powder blue tunic and white boots? She thought that he had. In the auditorium, he had stood before the gathered students with Principal Benjamin. After the cheering died away, Principal Benjamin had spoken, not into a microphone, but into an intercom, so that his voice boomed from above, both in the auditorium and in the empty classrooms, perhaps, perhaps for the benefit of the terrariums. Melba remembered that he had spoken on the topic of color. Color, according to certain professionals, is not a part of things, not even things known chiefly for their colors, flowers, tropical birds, the most delicious of the cartoon-themed box cereals, but rather color gets attached to their surfaces later on. And Principal Benjamin must have had plenty to say about when and how the colors are attached. And Melba felt certain she had asked perspicacious questions about methods used to detach the colors and whether or not the detached colors could be stored and if they were scented or had particular tastes, which seem likely based on everyone's experience, for example, of red. But as she devoted more energy to remembering and began to hear the voice transmitting over the intercom, she discovered that the words did not bear out her initial thought that Principal Benjamin had spoken about color, unless, of course, he had spoken in code, which was not impossible. No, the more Melba thought, the more she remembered that he had not spoken on the topic of color. She could hear his voice as he spoke on another topic altogether. Force and motion, my buckaroos. There's no escape, boom Principal Benjamin. Surrender your illusions. No one floats, not even in space. Astronauts are falling. Does this make you sad? It shouldn't. Are you cowboys or tin types? Wake up. Die on the ground with your boots on. Do you have a goldfish? Yes, called Melba. She was sitting in the front row, and Principal Benjamin pointed a finger at her, nodding gravely before going on. Is the bowl spotless, suffused with radiant energy? Is there a light shining in the castle window? Do you change the water? Do you keep fewer than two inches of fish per gallon? The fish don't stay still, said Melba, I think. Or is there slime on the bowl, said Principal Benjamin? Are the castle walls overgrown? Is there everywhere darkness and filth? Are there sheets of living tissue in the water? What if you purchased an algae-eating fish? Have you considered it? Yes, whispered Melba. Yes, crowed Principal Benjamin. Of course you have. Who hasn't? Imagine this algae eater. You're holding it up in a small plastic bag. It's skinny. It's hungry. Now let it go. <clears throat> Drop it in the bowl. Let it feast. Let it begin by devouring the protonaceous film on the surface of the water. Let it move on to the slime on the walls. Below, every rock has a beard. So much shag, so much sludge. What a smorgasbord. Do you think your algae eater can swallow all that muck, all that gunk, all that fuzz? Do the hairs tickle its throat? Does it gag? Melba held her breath. She felt in her own throat a tickle. She shook her head. Her eyes watered. 
Principal Benjamin's eyes were watering too. No, he cried, it explodes. It explodes into bits and every bit needs to eat. Every bit eats until it explodes. Don't you see? There are infinite bits exploding infinite times until there's nothing else left to eat. The biosphere is all bits eating bits. We're all done, we're all ooze. I'm sure our guest, Mr. Gray, would tell you as much if I hadn't exhausted the subject. And now let us adjourn to the cafeteria. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> Melba had joined the flow of children out of the auditorium and through a tiled corridor where she waited in line to scrub her hands at a long trough before walking on, filing with the others through the cafeteria doors, each child pausing before Nurse Nathan to receive a spoonful of dark paste doled from a colossal jar. Melva swallowed her pace, scanning the cafeteria tables. The astronaut she, sh she saw was in the middle of the room, seated across from Principal Benjamin at Principal Benjamin's desk, which Lester Crane, the custodian, had carried into the cafeteria for the occasion. Melba hovered near the desk anxiously, but Principal Benjamin and Mr. Gray were studying their trays and did not acknowledge her. She stepped closer to Mr. Gray and noted that his tunic smelled of ozone. She opened her mouth to speak. Suddenly, she felt a hand clap down on the back of her neck, and she was steered away from the desk, reprimanded harshly, and sent to the principal's office, where she cried a little, cross-legged on one of the clean squares of linoleum formerly concealed by Principal Benjamin's desk. Try as she might, Melba could not recall what happened next. When she attempted to reconstruct the sequence, her mind jumped from the image of the barren office to an image of the area below her kitchen sink, dark and cluttered with pipes, pale bottles, and a tall dented box, one corner savaged and spilling blue powder. Principal Benjamin's office and the area below her kitchen sink, envisioned one after the other, did make a kind of sequence, but not the sequence Melba wanted. That is, they didn't make a linear sequence, but rather an associative sequence, which perhaps told her something about her consciousness, but told her less than nothing about the order in which the events in her life unfolded. But was there an order? And if so, was that order chronological? And if so, chronological in which direction? Melba knew these weren't fit questions for a landlord, but could they be considered fit questions for an astronaut? Well, Melba thought, no use wondering. Only Principal Benjamin might have had some insight into Mr. Gray's whereabouts, and Principal Benjamin had disappeared. Melba had no way to contact an astronaut on her own. I do not have the telephone number for any astronaut, replied Melba primly. I do not have the telephone number for any astronaut, mimicked Gigi Zozo. So Mark Rand must receive every telephone call intended for a person whose number you do not have? How many telephone numbers don't you have? Why, it's an inconceivable amount, boggling. Do you see what kind of burden you place on Mark Rand? Even a landlord of his caliber couldn't bear up under it, and that's supposing you are his only tenant, which you are not. I didn't mean, began Melba, but Gigi Zozo cut her off. Of course you didn't mean, said Gigi Zozo. You never mean anything. You never anticipate, Melba. You don't understand the concept of the future. What's the future? Tell me. What if I don't tell you, asked Melba desperately. Will it just happen? Gigi Zozo growled long and low, and Melba clung to the phone, sweat breaking out along her brow. Does the future have something to do with snow, she asked? How it doesn't fall from the sky all at once, crushing everything below? You're just like your father, said Gigi Zuzzo bitterly. You always think things are so much rosier than they really are. Let me tell you, the future never kept anyone from getting crushed. I've noticed that you never buy depilatory creams, Melba. Your arms are fuzzy. Don't deny it, matted with little hairs like tennis balls. Now listen to this. One day you're going to see something startling and not in a good way. You'll see a piece of straw driven like a skewer through a man's neck by gale force winds. How awful! Who wants to see such a thing? Not you. You'll throw your arm across your eyes and those little hairs will act like Velcro on your eyeballs. You'll rip out your eyeballs. They'll be stuck to your arm. That's the future, Melba. That's what not meaning gets you, eyeballs on your arm. Why won't you buy depilatory creams? They smell wonderful, like scorched lemons. They're cheap. You never shop, Melba. It's killing you, not just in the future, right now. I had a bad experience with the pillatory cream, said Melba. My skin started to smoke, the skin above my upper lip, and the smoke went right into my nose. I had to wear your snorkel and sleep with my face in a bowl of water. I couldn't possibly go through that again. I don't even have my own snorkel, and it's not about the depilatory cream, said Gigi Zuzzo. It's about shopping more generally. When you shop, you expand, Melba. 
You stretch out your hand and also your psyche to compass the thing that you desire. And then, when the moment is right, you clay up down. You squeeze around the thing. Expansion and contraction, Mel, but that's shopping. It's a spasm, a special spasm. You've heard of these spasms? Not just a pleasant jolt. Jolts don't penetrate to great depth and they have no duration. A spasm is different. It's a rippling that works the fascia to keep your inner linings from drying out. Have you ever seen a person with their inner lining? dried out? Melba considered. You have, snarled Gigi Zuzzo. Think, Melba. She never shopped. She worked in the bakery before you. How can you be so callous? You are her successor. Lisa Cucci, said Melba. She had succeeded Lisa Cucci as the bakery's employee. But Lisa Cucci's inner lining didn't dry out, protested Melba. She married Seton Holmes and started a new life. Lisa Cucci was spurned by Seton Holmes, said Gigi Zuzzo. The business council decided that the story should be suppressed. They kept it from you, Melba. I disagreed, but I'm not on the business council. I had no vote. What do I know about business? Nothing. If you've been informed about Lisa Cucci's being dried out and spurned, a husk of her former self, you might not have performed ably as her successor. You might have feared acceding to her position, knowing how it turned out. In that sense, I see the wisdom of the business council's decision. In another sense, though, I see the fallibility of the business council's reasoning because in not knowing Lisa Cucci's situation, you have made almost exactly the same mistakes. It doesn't bode well for your longevity as a bakery employee. But I suppose the business council makes calculations about all of that, about your rate of deterioration under Lisa Cucci-like conditions. They're already training your successor. If Lisa Cucci didn't start a new life with Seton Helms, whispered Melba, and if she isn't living her old life as a bakery employee, then what is Lisa Cucci doing? She's existing in a kind of limbo, said Jeezy Zuzzo. She doesn't do anything. She can't. She's neither here nor there, this nor that. You wouldn't recognize her. She's a wispy, pale thing, a tuft. It's as though she's been reduced to a single eyebrow. I bid you good day, Melba. Good day, said Melba. You don't raise me, snapped Gigi Zuzzo. You see my bid and that's all? Melba, have you no loins, no spark? Don't you aspire? I don't think so, said Melba. Good day, said Gigi Zuzzo. Good day, said Melba. Thank you. your writing, Joanna. I love it. <laughs> um, and it's such an honor to be working alongside you um, in the creative writing program. Um, I just, I, I felt this way during um, your reading at the, uh, your interview. It was one of the best readings I'd ever seen, and I've seen so many. Um, and today, this was a totally different, like totally different material, um, but just as incredibly strong and wow, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you all. It's so nice to um, see all of you here. Thank you for coming. Um, can you hear me okay back there? Is this all right? Um, thank you to the library lecture series and to Craig. Um, it's really exciting to be reading for the first time here at Wake Forest um, with the library lecture series and also um, for the beautiful, beautiful broadsides that you made of our poems at the ZSR Library Letter Press, which for those of you who don't know is just an incredible treasure <laughs> that we have here at Wake Forest, um, where Craig sets type, individual type, on an old letter press machine um, to commemorate um, events like this and, and um, for other sort of celebratory types of things. So uh, thank you so much, and we're really honored to be a part of that. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to read, I'm going to read a few poems um, from each of my books, starting with the first one, um, I Epiphany. And I decided, I like to sort of experiment with each reading um, when I'm thinking about what to read. And I feel like when you choose what to read, you're making an editorial choice as a writer. Um, sometimes I read work that just feels like I haven't read it in a while and I want to reconnect with it myself. Um, sometimes I think about where I'm reading and why I'm reading and um, maybe, you know, will curate 
a set of poems um, sort of in relation to a setting um, or to a group of people. And there was something about maybe my choice that I made last night, and I'm not sure exactly where it came from, but I was thinking about um, the relationship of poetry to politics. And I was thinking about how I often don't see my own poetry as um, overtly political poetry, but that one of the things I've been communicating in some of my classes this semester is that the act of writing poetry is a political act. And by that, I mean that it's a political act um, to spend time in the imagination and to use language in imaginative ways. And I've been thinking about, well, you know, what effect does that have on consensus reality? Um, but then, of course, there's other questions that drive me as a poet that have to do with sort of what is the effect of poetry on the mind and on consciousness. So I decided to read um, poems today that in some way address the concept of war um, and both in abstract ways um, and also in some, in some specific ways in some instances. So the first um, poems I'm going to read are short poems that lead up to a dialogue between two speakers that are contending with a question about war, um, with the question about sort of how language intersects with war, and also with, um, I would say, atomitic questions about language, which is when you speak something, can you make something happen? This is Replicators. Like flowers taking flight, migration is always a maiden voyage. I equip myself with a bionic device for dreaming through great distances. You speak in filigree biology, tracking the sun across the sky. Other things trade wings, lift off. Guide star. I am merchandising the masks to provisionally alter the empire. Multiple dimensions like gems telescope us. I navigate the sentinel, widely broadcasting its bootleg message so that I become good at losing a tune by the law of this language. Self-same. We could feel the directional laws pulsing through the loudspeaker of the atom. Give me a second, I write. My camera, like an accordion, plays diamonds as I search. Over there, you point. That's where I am capable of being swept out to sea. We are both starry and geode. We present our papers upon being asked, but not quickly enough. Later, we miss the opening credits and wonder who is responsible for the exoskeleton. The globe grows to twice its size. Now what are we supposed to do, you ask? Yet you seem unconcerned as you plant your tears into the topsoil. Towers. Transmitting from the highest peaks, faces surround us their novel endpoints. You behave first like water exploding through rocks, but quickly change into something else. Properties. We use the word galactic to mean impossible scale. Clusters operate the vast meadow of the spiral arm. I take pictures and report on their interplay. We trade maps and make the one we've just received into an antenna. The map I give away is consider considered dangerous due to its legend. The legend becomes a circuit that can be combined with other circuits to form a book. Once you have enough circuits, you can plug the book's receivers into each eye. Our antenna will act as the primary vessel for correspondence. We say radio, but mean radical. Battle zone. Bright lights, bright lights dot the continents like constellations. We carve these four corners as thieves underground. World lines. Even as the sun moves and blindfolds the sky, an entirely new clock gene, glittering, allowing light access, clock containing cells, realignments will keep diagramming us, linking the clock to an extinct compass. Metropolis. Like the city inside yourself, golden, ruminative, you build a planet for your binding. The second day, an emerald flame. The third day, a skylight paper. 
The fourth day, we make a wish at the foot of a fountain. The wish that became a genealogical door on the fifth day opened into a blue evening wormhole, but I already admitted we were in foreign territory. The cross-section sal talisman of the sixth day protected us from tomorrow. The wind changed into mineral deposits on the seventh day, and we finally had a space to splice, as we will see in the next chapter. Neuro. It is a tesseract nation, the midnight daylight threshold. You write this, I model this in a warp drive. Our dialogue persuades me to change my expectations. Reading is relative progress, as if these sentences conjugate. The island through the window is reminiscent of a manual persuading my persona to blueprint its visuals. Steadfast. Threads peel away the texture to reveal additional textures. The wallpaper never ends, and so I appear to myself like the forest at the end of the book, breathing, but also crowding, distancing, uncovering. Mosaics. Like lightning, the heroes inside us build lunar colonies. We are poised for first contact. I mobilize my statements, which are not exactly true. What do you make of the war and our performance? What war? The performance is a war. The war, I mean. I see feathers in your hair. Stop that. Stop what? The war. What do you mean? I only see feathers. Well, sure, I see feathers too. Good, so you agree. Not really, but I am a performer. You can't trust me. Hmm, what did you say? I said, what do you mean I can't trust you? To perform? Well, could you, even during the war? What war? What war? Are you serious? Are there feathers allowed in your war? What do you mean by allowed? Can one have or use feathers in this war of yours? This isn't my war. Of course it isn't. I wasn't saying that. Right, sure. Are you being sarcastic? No, I just don't trust you. That's what I said. No, that's what I said before the war. I don't remember it that way. Well, it's not a matter of remembering, but it is a matter of tone. What tone? Your tone. Right, okay then. Despite this, I almost trust you. You do? Why would you? Because you have feathers. I do? Yes, can't you feel them, see them, something? I haven't noticed any uh, feathers. Of course you haven't. Seriously? Yes, seriously. Well, if I had feathers, don't you think I would know that? I didn't. You didn't notice your feathers at first? Not really. They were very light. Well, of course they're light. They are feathers. Exactly. I wouldn't be able to perform poetry with feathers. Obviously you perform with them. What are you getting at? Well, it's obvious you perform poetry with feathers. I mean, come on. How is it obvious? Are you serious? Yes, I'm serious. I want to know how it's obvious. Well, for one thing, I see them. You see them? On me? Where? Right there, everywhere. You see feathers everywhere? Well, yes, don't you? I only see feathers on you. How convenient. They give your performance an inexplicable quality. Well, sure, they help me fly, hover, etc. It's not really that. The feathers, they do something else. What do you mean? You know what I mean. You must. No, really, I don't. Tell me, what else do my feathers do? They deepen your performance. You know. Tell me more. I don't know. Stop questioning me. OK, OK. Your feathers, on the other hand, are quite sublime. I don't have feathers. And if I did, they wouldn't be sublime. Sure, they might also be invisible. Yes, I would have invisible feathers. And would you be invisible too, along with your feathers? Well, if I was, I could probably stop the war. You could? Yes, it only makes sense. But I thought I was supposed to stop the war. Well, then go ahead and stop it. I will then. Then do. Fine, I will stop the war. I'm waiting. Well, it might take some time. Right. I'll have to rehearse. That will take forever. I didn't say the plan was perfect. True, but you should at least have a time frame. For what again? To stop the war. Pay attention. Oh, right. I can stop the war. Yes, yes, you can. I can? Wait. No, I can't. 
but you can. The feathers in your hair are invisible. No, they aren't. Yes, they are. I think your feathers can stop the war. I think yours can. I don't have feathers. I see them, sure, but you see feathers everywhere. War too. I'm gonna read a poem in three short um, sections called Clinamen Principium. And it's a term, the title is a term um, based on what Lucretius called the atomic swerve, which has been used by artists um, over and over again as a metaphor for the imagination. The imagination happens at the moment of a swerve. So it's about spont the spontaneous swerve and the swerve that happens outside of logic. Um, but really a swerve that happens inside poetic logic. Um, and this was, uh, this was a sort of meditation on, on the, the atomic swerve. Clinamen Principium. Within the atomic swerve does a probability always branch. Presto, my lightning of apparitions, masks depicting something else. By sentences we culminate. The philosopher's stones ingest me to astonish. I interpret the terse fires, but cannot go in. I forest territorializes. To think visibly, my extensions must never be fixed. A material presence, this gesture is a galactic strata made from suggestion, amplitude, oracular, nevertheless. What is the definition of gravity which is its snapshot. As I crowned the perimeter with words, free thinking, and someone clapped in unison from the velvet balcony above. The object of time and space, you altered my findings, equidistant, like planets in a rare orbit. Everywhere, you and I, our subjects collecting all of it, dear space reader. Please describe the borders that multiply you, their indeterminacies, the furtive exceptions. In pictures of the universe, how do we keep from looking inward? As if the result of the expansion is music or the collection and collision of vibrating strings that are encountered when we play instruments meant for reasoning. What is the distance between light and its future? I point to fugitive patterns moving the compass, which is a metal designed for a certain kind of revolt for and against the senses, the war, the axis of directions in which we accumulate ourselves. Simultaneously, history hallucinates from its sleep, your calibration, scavenger, superfluous within the war. My readership is part immaterial, as if each dream or the experience of it privileges relative structures, the ongoing measure of the dream in proportion to the dreamer. This next poem is called Under the Perils, and it's a poem I wrote maybe 10 years ago. Um, and in it, I reference my new book, the title of it, Starlight and Two Million. But in this poem, uh, Starlight and Two Million is a movie that's being played. Um, and that's something that I've actually done between all of my books. Um, all of my books reference the other book. <laughs> and the book I'm writing right now um, was referenced in I Epiphany, my first book. Um, so I'm really interested in kind of creating conversations between my work, um, between different distinct projects. And um, for example, uh, I Epiphany is referenced in, in Multiversal, the second book, and Starlight in Two Million is referenced in Multiversal, but then in the new book, um, this book is actually like a setting <laughs> for the new book. And this book um, plays a role um, between two characters. One character is like stealing this book for another person. Um, so this is sort of the first reference of Starlight in Two Million um, and in a poem called Under the Perils. At last the night long row of saturated bark near hills through the pale you seek something. Offer me my own city. It happened all at once, pools and ice. The curve of pools within the ice ice breaking around the pool, water floats. Holding your breath all the way back, 
the so-called margins of error, no time, having dreamt it only speech. It is our understanding that I am working as much as possible. The dancers left the house limping. The fruit was all the same color. I see two people trade mouthpieces. They claim they are survivors of the miracles. In the vaulted morning, at the two-way mirror flashing indigo, I lose the myth of the witch and the eagle, the famed belt of satellites. I speak of this persistently for the shrill of high tide warnings. From which of the four translucent regions do I bury marked sand dollars out to sea? Gathered at the foreground around signs near the heartwood, near the theater showing starlight in two million, the orchestra is aligned, the instruments tuned. The premise is as clear as texture welling up in the folds of leaves. It could be called beauty or behavior, as if contained in the temporal bone, the time through which a portion of your heart extends. Sunlight empties the body of all its transparencies, leaving space for a rocket and its gemstone engine. Earth pivots on a pearl. Roy G. Biv, there is a war being fought, but I heard the trick is to dismantle all sides. So I divide the glow from the gold, the ricochet culture from the resistance to it, the dreams from the asteroid threats that race within me. But there are rooms containing all of this. I was 945,388,800 seconds old, creating space charts, space charts a posteriori. The elements are not worth memorizing. A benevolent person stands by as a reminder what drilled in as we lit. So in Starlight and Two Million, um, there are two characters that join forces to stop a war. And the war and the type of war is not ever really named. It's kind of in every war. Um, and they come from what's called the temporary autonomous zones, which is sort of a safe place um, within this multiverse where war prevails. Um, they, the, the book itself is written about these two characters um, entering a war, what happens um, after they survive it, and after they leave the war, the book itself sort of devolves, so to speak, or maybe evolves or mutates into poetry. Um, so there's a structural argument being made in the book um, about the sort of transition or relationship between prose and poetry, which the book contains both, um, and also uh, sort of the other argument I would say that's being played, that's being made is that the imagination is a legitimate response to addressing the problems of war. Um, and in the chapter that I'm going to read first um, from Starlight in Two Million uh, is called Blue Shifts. And it's the point, it's the point where Alethea, the main character, um, is, has just received a transmission, which is the eye epiphany from Epike the other character. And Alethea's name comes from a Greek word um, that means, uh, normally means truth. Um, Martin Heidegger retranslated that word to mean unconcealedness. And I really like this idea of this word Alethea, not meaning truth, but meaning something unconcealed. And I, I, saw, I saw Heidegger's distinction in that retranslation of that word, and I wanted to make a main character out of the, out of the embodiment of being unconcealed. And then epike is her, is this partner. And um, epike in Greek means to suspend belief in the real world. So symbolically, <laughs> the state of being unconcealed while suspending belief in the real world um, becomes an imaginative and legit a legitimate response um, to war. So in this chapter, she's just re she's, she hasn't met Epike yet, but she has just received this transmission. She's also a sort of digital character, um, so you'll notice she's like uploading in the, in the chapter. Blue Shifts. It begins slowly with a civilization, a blue sail. The picture she makes is an observatory from space, 
the same degree of curvature at every location. It is a language that is a dwelling. She uses the colors for their charges. Out of the particular, she gathers and unites the picture, which acts like a mirror. The picture traces her speech, which is really the mouth of a voyage and a massive net sifting blue waters. At the end of the world, the ship empties its contents. Nothing remains of my castle in the air, believing as we do in the explorer you seem to be. Alethea recites the story she has heard a thousand times. Its astro science frees her. Waking, she feels her dreaming body emerge as if being pushed from underground. She stretches. The room gets louder, more prominent. Quickly, she uploads. She feels for the patterned lock. The pattern is like a library. The library is like a town. The town is like a drift. The drift is like a cloud. The cloud is like an eye. The eye is like a hook. The hook is like a rare wing. The wing is like her rapid heart, its cellular automata patterning for clues. It used to be difficult, but with, trime, with time, she grew stronger, more perceptive. Alethea checks the transmission for authenticity. It's brighter than she expected, denser like a star. According to some interpretations, the eye epiphany is a treatise for disinformation, but it's something else that secures our place in the war, which we don't quite see our place. The war appears as though it's in a bubble somewhere, floating up and down rivers, to the side, upside down over mountains that don't look like mountains, over cities that don't look like cities, over families that don't look like families. And the bubble is suspended at times and stops. When we look into the bubble through its transparent film, our vision becomes a curtain between myself and the war and situated inside a different bubble, one that is self-created like all the others, I believe that no one really dies. No one really dies. I don't, Alethea thinks, except that when I die, I am made into a dwelling that is a language. Alethea's cities are not cities. Her mountains are not mountains. The river running through the foreground is not a river, but an artery into her heart. And the bubble is detectable only by how everything outside of it behaves. At the beginning of the day, when the waves are calm and the water recedes, when the sun lights the beach house in her memory that is her home, the bubble, like all bubbles, dissolves, releasing its ephemera into the blue sea to be sifted by massive nets for signs of treasure. So I suppose like a war reading wouldn't be complete without a poem about love at the end. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to read a chapter from Starlight called Let There Be Love as a hopeful ending. <laughs> she lives in one of the crystal petals of the constellation in a wing she called starfish and in the multiple arms or bodies when her eyes were open along with all the others of the stone sea. The sky, a hundred mirrors, sets once every 10 days until the 11th day when it grows. The waves came in lost languages. The starfish looked like a country. The official version omitted everything that didn't glow. She lives on the borderland, which is itself one of the feathers on the wing. She uses the pink most frequently, but also indigo in a dreaming blue. The collarbone is always made from the most delicate shells, having been collected from long walks holding hands in the novella. She enjoys creature comforts, handmade shawls made from unspeakable patterns back when the costume designers were open for business. Every window is decorated with her favorite planet. The planets spin between worlds as worlds. The wing is spinning towards someone else's window. Her favorite planet dissolves. When she wakes, the planets wake too. The sun moves easily through the stone sea. It flies assuredly through the mirror sky. It hovers over skyscrapers and people drop pearls from their eyes. She picks up the pearls and drives to the sea where she tries to skip them like rocks. They roll in her hands, collapse into the waves, get caught in the crevices and vanish down impossible fissures. They coalesce under the water in luminous patches. 
After several months, people go to look for their pearls. They begin with day trips, but eventually stay overnight in the undersea reefs. Each person is an explorer. Innumerable discoveries are made. Some discoveries are made into lockets. Some prompt people to move. Some discoveries heal the passage of time, but then another discovery is made and time is thought to be without passage. Some discoveries take years to accept. Some are immediately forgotten. Some are offered to friends as something else. Some are visible only above the sea. Some discoveries exist for just a moment. Some make exploring easier, faster, and more fulfilling. Some can be whatever you want. I am reading one now. Thank you.